I have a feeling that my battery is gonna die while I'm filming this, so uh, we'll see how far we get before I have to go grab another battery. <laughs> Hello, welcome back to my channel, or welcome if this is your first time here. As you can tell from the title of the video, this is going to be my first trimester update for baby number two. When I am filming this, I am 12 weeks and 12 and a half weeks, and we are just starting to tell our friends, family, um, I've told work, and so we're just kind of making the rounds. By the time you see it, I'll probably be 13 or 14 weeks along. We'll kind of see how that kind of plays out, but I'm very excited to be finally filming this, finally sharing it, and I'm gonna go ahead and talk about my symptoms, how we found out we were pregnant, how long we were trying, was this a planned baby number two? Uh, we'll get into all those details in this video. If you missed my pregnancy announcement, I posted that before this video so you can check that out. And we're gonna get into the nitty gritty details here today. If you're interested in my first pregnancy and how that went and like what my symptoms were and how that all progressed, that was during 2020. Like it was a very weird time. This is gonna be, I hope, a very different experience. I'll leave that playlist down below. I'm gonna rename them, so I'll probably name that one like baby number one, and I'll do one for baby number two. So let's go ahead and get into it. I have lots to share. I have my phone here with all the notes. I've been taking notes, and I can also go back and compare them to my first pregnancy. So let's go ahead. Let's just get right into it. So like I said at the beginning of the video, this is pregnancy number two for me, baby number two. So I kind of had an idea of like what pregnancy was gonna be like going into it this time, just because I've already experienced it, but I knew it was probably gonna be a lot more challenging, a lot more tiring than the first one, simply because I have a toddler running around. Rhea, my daughter, she is going to be two in a couple of weeks, and she has a lot of energy, and so I kind of knew that I was gonna probably be more exhausted, and this was gonna be a little bit harder. Boy, I did not know what I was getting myself into when we were getting into this first trimester, so I'm just gonna go ahead, I'm gonna pull my phone, we can go over it week by week and kind of go through the symptoms and the notes and the aversions and all those things that come with pregnancy. So to start things out, I want to talk a little bit about like how long we were trying and what kind of like our approach was to baby number two. This was planned. We did go into 2022 knowing that we wanted to start trying for baby number two. So I had my birth control removed in January. I personally had a Mirena. I've had three, I think, and I've had no issues with them. I really like them. It's my preferred birth control method. I've tried many other birth control methods and that's just the one that works for me. So I had had the Mirena before I got pregnant with Rhea and so I kind of thought it would be a similar time frame. I didn't actually have like a full cycle until February and then after that I actually started to take ovulation tests just because with a toddler and being so busy this time around I just really wanted to know when I was ovulating. So I did that and and April came around and my period actually showed up early at the very beginning of May. It was like a week or two early and I was really confused. Started to get a little bit concerned. I got even more concerned in the middle of May because the ovulation test strip never turned dark enough to be considered positive and so I thought I didn't even ovulate in May. That was not true at all. That was the month that I ended up getting pregnant. I tested for a pregnancy test on the Tuesday after Memorial Day. It was positive right away. It was just one of those cheap ones from Amazon. It was really really faint. The line turned over right away and I took that same test the next few days and it got a little darker. I finally took a digital test like over that weekend after my period would have been missed for like five days and it sure in fact showed up pregnant and so overall it took us about four to five months to conceive so it kind of depends on like how you count you know my cycles but it was planned. This was like on the list of things that we were kind of shooting for, I guess, in 2022. We just kind of knew like that was the timing. We just moved in this house in November, so we kind of felt like we were ready, we had the space, so here we are. <laughs> All right, so let's go ahead, let's get into the symptoms and like what happened after I found out that I was pregnant. So right away, week number four of pregnancy, so like right away when I found out, I found out on the day I would have gotten my period, so it was, it was literally week four of being pregnant. Um, I had back aches right away. I noticed that I didn't have any back aches or back pains with Rhea, so I thought that was really weird. It's starting to get a little bit better now that I'm 
almost out of my first trimester so the doctor said she thinks it's just hormones and my muscles relaxing and my bones kind of relaxing and I think it's just getting a little bit better now that the hormones have leveled out but um, that's actually something I'm going to look into I'm gonna look into pelvic floor therapist and like a prenatal therapist and see if like maybe I can get that sorted out because I don't want back pain throughout my entire pregnancy and I also want to make sure it's you know better for postpartum. I had cramping the night before I took my test. I remember I was sitting on the couch and I was cramping and I thought that was kind of weird. It was not like normal period cramps. So that kind of like had a little light bulb go off in my head. I kind of was like okay maybe but I didn't look too much into it because like I said I didn't have a positive ovulation test that month so I wasn't really looking that much into it but I did note that. Week four right away I had nausea like really light but it was definitely there and then I don't have any notes until week six because I had no other symptoms until week six. I was like completely normal. I didn't have like any like breast tenderness. I wasn't so nauseous that I couldn't function. Like I felt really good. I had a lot of energy and I was like feeling really positive. I really want this pregnancy to be a more positive experience than my pregnancy with Rhea just simply because of the time when I was pregnant with her. It was the majority of it was through 2020 and obviously that year was totally different and very challenging for everybody and so I was actually pretty depressed during my pregnancy with her and I didn't realize it until after. I really want this to be a different experience. So during those first couple weeks I was really excited, really positive. I was trying to have like positive thoughts and was doing a lot of research and like trying to figure out what I wanted to do in terms of like delivery because I had a c-section with Rhea so I was doing a lot of v-bag research and I was really excited and had a ton of energy so I don't have anything noted other than uh back aches and I was nauseous week four. Week six was when I started to do pregnancy exercises so that was came up in the research that I did specifically like pregnancy core exercises so I really want to focus on my core and having a strong core and having really good strength for breathing and for ultimately pushing my goal and I'll talk about this at the end of the video is to have an unmedicated hopefully be back and so I'm really trying to prepare my body for that this time and also to prepare my body for postpartum recovery. Last time I kind of just went into it thinking I'm really fit, I'm really healthy, I'll be totally fine. I think that that definitely worked like I think it helps because I recovered from my c-section pretty quickly but I really am taking a different mindset this time really want to be prepared and I'm really focusing a lot more on like my strength and my ability to like be pregnant and to be in postpartum and to recover from that like thinking more as like prenatal and postpartum versus just being fit. I'm still working out by the way. I'm still doing all the same exercises that I was doing before I've been cleared to work out. It's all the same exercises I did when I was pregnant with Raya as well. It's my normal lifts. I lift four days a week. I do like back legs, chest, glutes. I do it all. I just have lowered the weight on some of my exercises like my deadlifts because my back was hurting. I lowered the weight just a little bit and then my squats and like my Romanian deadlifts. I also lowered those just like very slightly. At week six I also noticed that I had less hair coming out in the shower. I had very thick hair when I was pregnant with Rhea and it got even thicker postpartum so it's it's definitely reduced quite a bit. I can I can tell the difference. So my hair is getting very thick. I can already tell. I started to experience constipation. That's very normal in pregnancy, especially in your first trimester. I had that with Rhea as well. It was not comfortable. It was not fun, but it has since gotten a little bit better. I'm just doing my best to eat healthy and drink a lot of water just to like stay hydrated and to keep everything kind of moving. So week six and week seven was when I started to really get the pregnancy symptoms. The like first trimester, woe is me, pregnancy symptoms. And they were on another level this time. Like it was really strange. So I'm just going to read through it. So I started to become very nauseous, very fatigued, not tired. Like I had to sleep, just physically couldn't stand, couldn't even sit. I had to lie down. I had to be lying on the floor playing with Rhea. I had to be lying on the couch while my husband played with Rhea. I had to be lying in bed. Like I couldn't even sit like it was the weirdest thing. I felt absolutely awful. The humidity made me so sick. It was so nauseating. I couldn't go outside at all. It was very humid and very hot um, during those few weeks and I, I just I couldn't even go outside. So I was starting to kind of get a little bit down. I was like I'm not going to be able to enjoy summer. I'm just absolutely miserable. 
I just didn't know what I was gonna do if that's how I was gonna feel for the next, you know, eight months. But I'm feeling better, so it did resolve. But um, yeah, I started to feel absolutely awful. My workouts were terrible. I could not even do them. Like I would go downstairs, I would start working out, I would sit down on the bench and I would sit there for the next 45 minutes. Like I couldn't even get back up to just go upstairs and lie down on the bed. No food sounded good. Coffee was awful. I experienced a coffee aversion when I was pregnant with Rhea. I just, I couldn't eat anything, nothing. Nothing sounded good. I ended, I mean, I was eating saltines because I had to, that was the only thing. But after about two weeks of that, saltines were starting to make me sick. And like water was making me sick. It was, it was not okay. <laughs> I mean like, I wasn't throwing up and I didn't end up hospitalized. So I know that that can absolutely happen, but it was pretty bad. It was a lot worse than my pregnancy with Rhea. Yeah, I have week seven morning sickness to the fullest is what I wrote down. So week eight was my first prenatal appointment at the office that I'm currently at, which we'll get into. Um, you, you see a PA or an NP. And so we just saw the PA. She was actually the gal that assisted with my C-section. Talked through all the things that I already knew about. It was like all of the same stuff that I had been given when I was pregnant with Rhea. So it wasn't like anything too surprising or like there wasn't anything new, so it was a pretty straightforward appointment. We had an ultrasound, everything looked good. At the appointment, I was measuring at seven weeks, five days, and I was like on week eight, but we went to the 12-week appointment and everything's measuring on track. I started using the bathroom at least once a night during week eight, and I've been doing that ever since. Also, something totally different. I did not have that with Rhea. I didn't start using the bathroom in the middle of the night till I was probably like eight months pregnant when I was pregnant with Rhea. And so now I get up between midnight and two to go to the bathroom. It kind of stinks. Last night I got up at like 2.45 and I didn't fall back to sleep until 3.45 and I get up at 4.45 to work out, so that kind of was awful. I started showing at week eight, yeah, definitely a little bit earlier than I probably wanted to, but there's not much you can do about that, especially baby number two. And week eight, we actually got COVID. <laughs> um, we had not had it. We have been able to avoid it, which is kind of crazy. My husband works in healthcare, he's a nurse, and so the fact that we never had gotten it was kind of crazy to me. I wasn't really like surprised or anything that we got it. Rhea got it first, and then we got it, and it wasn't like that bad. Like we were really healthy, and it was mild, and you know, it was, it was like a three-day thing. Like we had a fever one day, and then we had like a, maybe another two days where we were sick, but like the fact that I was pregnant and like having these absolutely extreme awful symptoms is what made it really bad honestly what the three days that i had like the covid symptoms and was feeling sick from that they weren't that bad compared to the pregnancy symptoms and like i i just i don't know it was really strange i'm sure that if i hadn't been pregnant it it would have been just like you know three days of being sick and i would have been fine but paired with being pregnant and having all those other symptoms it was just, it was not a fun week. And it was over the 4th of July holiday, so we couldn't even go anywhere, do anything. <laughs> Again, I was kind of feeling bad. I was like, I'm gonna miss out on summer. This is no fun. It's gotten better, I promise. So my next notes start at week 10, and that's because that's when I started to feel better. I very specifically remember week 10 and two days was when I started to feel better because I was able to do my full workout that morning. Um, it was chest day. And so I remember being like, okay, I'm coming out of it. I'm feeling better. It was like fingers crossed. I didn't want to jinx it, but I started to get back to feeling normal. I had less nausea, less fatigue. That general like awful feeling was gone. I started to have a little bit more energy. I was starting to be able to drink coffee again so like that was really good and then again i noted that i was showing so i think what happened is around week 10 i started to get a lot of bloating and a lot of it is bloat like throughout the day as i'm drinking a lot of water and like i'm just eating i'm getting a lot of bloating because it's all like really high and obviously baby is so low during your first trimester and I, when i get up in the morning like i don't look like that so it's a lot of bloating but i just feel like i'm showing quite a bit and i'm very short i'm five feet tall any weight fluctuation on me shows so week 10 i put feeling like myself again almost no symptoms and starting to get harder to jump rope i think that's just like as you progress in pregnancy at least when i was pregnant with raya i started to get more clumsy like i just have less coordination and so i think that's all that it is. I'll probably stop jumping rope pretty soon. I stopped jumping rope when I was pregnant with Rhea at week 13. But it'll probably be pretty soon. It's probably not the best thing to do. I mean, like, there's, my doctor didn't say anything about not doing it, but, you know, 
it's just probably not the best thing to do. You could trip, you could fall. I feel like that's probably like the biggest concern with that. And then week 12, I put that I can feel little movements. I turned to my husband and I told him, I was like, I, you're gonna think I'm crazy, but I swear to you that I can feel little flutters. And we went to our OB appointment the next day and the baby was moving a ton. And so I don't think that it's kicks or anything like that. I just think it's just movement like whatever movement baby is doing in there it's kind of like reverberating on like my uterus and then like on my stomach and it's just tiny little things it's 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 they're very tiny but i have i have felt little 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 somethings i met with my ob at my 12 week appointment like i said you meet with a pa or an np at week eight and started to talk to her about my birth plan and my birth wishes and things did not go exactly the way that I wanted to unfortunately like I said I had a c-section with Rhea she was a breech baby so I was unlabored and c-section delivery I had the best experience I love my doctor I've been going to her for 10 years she's amazing I trust her she's fantastic but there are limitations within the practice that she's in for VBACs that are making me think about considering another provider but there's a caveat with that as well because of where we live we live pretty far from the cities there's not a lot of options out here and obviously like i knew that when we moved that that may happen but i was even more disappointed when i got onto like the facebook group for the like area which i live and asked for recommendations i was very specific and told them like the cities that i was looking and nobody listened everybody told me to go to a doctor that is at least an hour drive or more away from me and when i would explain that i really need other options if they're available um i basically felt like they were shaming me for not taking the time to drive to this provider which for some people it may be totally worth it but i also have to take to, into consideration the fact that i work so driving an hour and a half to an appointment and having an hour an appointment and then driving another hour and a half home that's that's a work day for me and I just that's not something I'm able to swing not that my manager is like like she told me don't worry about it she was like just go to the doctor's appointments like you're totally fine but like I still feel like that's something I have to consider I also have to consider my toddler like when we're in the hospital if I'm at a hospital that's an hour and a half away like what if something happens and we need to get back to her like what if something happens and she needs to come to us like what if there's nobody available to even watch her because we do live like in an area where we don't have a lot of people that could watch her so I just don't really know what to do right now and I guess I can kind of talk about like what I want for my delivery and then kind of what my doctor and what other providers in the area have kind of been saying. So I personally want to do, I want to have a successful VBAC, so I want to do a TOLAC with trial of labor after C-section, <laughs> and I want to do it as unmedicated as possible with as few medical interventions as possible. That's because a lot of the stuff that I have read online, a lot of the research and a lot of the testimonials from individuals that have had successful feedbacks say that that is the best route to take. Now, I understand that like medical interventions may be necessary, you know, depending on what the situation, but for the most part, a healthy person with a healthy baby trying to have a healthy delivery can decline those medical interventions and they'll be just fine. And so that's my approach. That's really what I want to do. I bought a hypnobirthing book, um, so I really wanted to look into that so that I can really try and avoid specifically an epidural. Like, I'm, I'm open to other forms of pain relief and trying to get through the pain but like I am specifically trying to do it on unmedicated no epidural. That is kind of my hope, my wish. When I explained that to my doctor she seemed a little bit hesitant. She seemed to think that I would benefit from having an epidural simply because I had a c-section previously and having the epidural is kind of a fail-safe should an emergency happen and I need to be rushed to the ER for a, or for, to the OR for a c-section. I don't have to be put under, we don't have to wait for pain meds, all I have to do is push more meds through the epidural. I totally understand where she's coming from, but it was it was just a little bit disheartening for her to like immediately kind of like push back on it. I'm not even in the like labor and delivery room, you know, I'm 12 weeks along and we're just like talking about it and to already kind of feel that, I, I just, it was a little bit, it was a little bit disheartening. The other thing is their practice will not induce you under any circumstances if you previously had a c-section. Now the chances of me needing, me needing to be induced are so low, I understand that, like I would have to have gestational diabetes or high blood pressure, some other type of medical condition that would 
like be harmful for the baby like for example they are giving ultrasounds to everybody that had covid in pregnancy at 32 weeks to kind of see like where baby's growth is to see if they need to change anything in their care plans like that could be something and then also if i go to 41 weeks those are like the four big reasons like you would be induced if you were not a previous c-section patient and they will not do it in that practice i'm really upset about that as well because i would much rather be induced than go right to a c-section especially if the baby is head down and like I has a chance of coming out vaginally so that is also pretty disappointing now if you look at the other provider options in my area there is a hospital closest to us that seems like a really good option they do induce if you need to be they do VBACs they have a really good center actually they just redid it but I personally was not comfortable when I was there in January that's where I had my IUD removed I just didn't have a great experience it kind of just rubbed me the wrong way and I also know a couple people in the area that have had pretty negative experiences there specifically with c-sections and with care during gestational diabetes there's no NICU there the closest hospital with a NICU is about half an hour away but there is a chance that the one that is hour and a half away would be the one that would show up and that's a long ways <laughs> from home and so that's also something I have to take into consideration. The final option that seems to be available right now, I've called around and kind of seen what my options were and the one I just got back today from a provider that does VBACs, they will induce, they're in the area, the clinic is um, you know within a reasonable driving distance. I just have to call back and kind of find out where they deliver, like what hospital it's at, and a few other questions that I have. I'm just kind of keeping my options open. I honestly don't know what I'm gonna do. I, I'm really unsure of what to do because, like I said, I love my doctor. I mean, I trust her so much, and I don't want anybody else to do a c-section if for some reason I do need to have one, but I really, really want to be back, and I really really want to do everything that I can to be successful at one, at least that's within my power. <laughs> and so I just, I don't know what to do. I'm just kind of going on and will probably just stay with my current provider until I have a feeling of what to do one way or the other. I'm just going to have to be really honest with her and talk it out because if I go to her and I tell her that I'm really uncomfortable with some of the things that she said and I don't know what to do and she might say, that sh I should find another provider. And I, like if she does that, it, it would not be a negative thing. I wouldn't take it poorly. I hope that she wouldn't take my feedback poorly, but it may just not be a good fit. I don't know. We'll see kind of like how that plays out. I'll definitely keep you updated as, as I go, but um, yeah, that's kind of where I'm at right now. All right, this video is a little bit long, so I'll kind of wrap it up. I am planning to do, in addition to like a first trimester update, I'll probably do 20 weeks, second trimester, and then like a third trimester update at about 36 weeks. I did that with Rhea. That seemed to be a pretty good amount of time in between each one to like make sure you're getting like the big updates, but it's not so close and you're just getting like a few updates. So I think that'll be what I do this time. And then there'll be postpartum videos. Now I can also kind of like share more stuff in vlogs and we're doing the painting the rooms. And so we have a lot of stuff going on. So I do have a lot of content planned. I had kind of a lull there for a little while just because I felt so bad I couldn't do anything also I couldn't really talk about it so it kind of made it kind of made videos in June and July a little bit sparse that's it that's my first trimester update for baby number two let me know down below if you are pregnant or you've gone through a few pregnancies like your symptoms totally change from pregnancy to pregnancy like if you're pregnant how are you feeling let me know I know that the first trimester can be very hard and like kind of like you're so colluded you're kind of in your own world if you're choosing not to tell people and just feel bad so know that if you're in your first trimester it gets better you'll get through it i promise and it'll be totally worth it i hope you're having a good day or a good week whenever you're seeing this and i will see you in my next video bye